This isn't just another normal Sunday. And praise God, he's here. Amen. I'm going to introduce Steve Manley. I've known him for a long time. He could probably tell you some things about me when I was a kid, but I told him better not. <laughs> but uh, he's been part of my family for years, and God has just blessed him and his ministry, and we're so grateful that he's here. And we're so grateful that his message is, if you haven't caught it today, Jesus. Dr. Steve Manley, will you come, Minister? Sure, thank you. Well, what a delight. I appreciate uh, the worship. I really enjoyed the saxophone. I, if I could, I'd put this sermon in that saxophone and blow it all over you. <laughs> That's what I'd like to do. <laughs> oh, my. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be entering into a study that I'd like to share with you this morning, give you the setting of it this morning and tonight. And then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we'll get into the details of uh, verse 15 uh, down through verse 26. We probably won't get very far in it, but uh, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 1, verse 15 through verse 26. The significance of Acts chapter 1, verse 15 through 26 is it's the first recorded business meeting of the early church. I don't know if you've ever looked at your board business meetings and said, oh, sacred word of God. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but here's the business meeting, uh, business minutes of this early church, the first meeting that they had. And we're going to investigate that. So if you'd like to read it ahead of time, uh, read, read that, study it a little on your own. God may something, say something good to you and you can share it with me and I'll preach it across the country and people will think I'm great. So <laughs> that would be wonderful. Uh, this morning and the setting of that uh, verse 15 through 26, I want you to look at the first three verses of chapter 1. You know that Luke wrote the book of Acts and the, the book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke. He wrote both of those. But what you, what you may not have known is that he wrote both of them at the same time. They were not two books, they were one book. They would read, as it circulated in the early church, they'd read the volume one, which we call the Gospel of Luke. They'd read that, then they'd have a break, probably a coffee break, and then they would come back and read volume two, which ended up being the book of Acts. But they read it all at one setting. Now the significance of that is this, that they, uh, it was for the purpose of theme. In other words, the theme of one is the theme of the other. In other words, he didn't write the Gospel of Luke, and then come up with another idea six months later and say, oh, I think I'll write another book about another book. <coughs> no, he wrote both of them with one idea in mind. So the theme runs through. Whatever the theme of the book of Acts is, is the theme of the Gospel of Luke. And whatever the theme of the book of Luke is, is the theme of the book of Acts. Same theme. Well, what's the theme of the Gospel of Luke? Oh, here's one man. If you study it carefully, here's one man. One man, one man, one man. How do you explain his birth? Holy Spirit. How do you explain the birth of his forerunner? Holy Spirit. How do you explain his ministry? Holy Spirit. Do you, isn't it significant, folks, that Jesus didn't do anything for 30 years? I mean, for 30 years he did no preaching, no miracles, no parables. I think he goes a little late deep. But outside of that, he didn't do anything. And then all of a sudden, Jesus went wild. I mean, he's all over the place. He's ministering. Miracles are taking place. Don't you look at him and say, Whoa, who flipped his switch? What happened to him? What turned him on? What caused all of this? And you know what caused it. He went down to John the Baptist and said, You're going to baptize me? No, I'm not. Yes, you are. They went down to the river. When they came out of the baptism, they had a prayer meeting. It wasn't the baptism. It was the prayer meeting. And the Father, through the Spirit, filled the man called Jesus. And everything Jesus did, he didn't do because he's God, although he is God. No problem. But everything Jesus did, he didn't do because he was God. He did it because he was a man filled with God. Amen. And that's promised to you. Now, we look at that and say, oh, well, that's Jesus. Hey, I can't be like Jesus. 
uh, you know, he was filled with the Spirit, okay, but Jesus was always straight, I'm always crooked. Jesus was dead on, I'm always dead off. Jesus was right, I'm wrong. There's no chance of me being like that. So then Luke picks up this idea and says, let's get a whole bunch of mean, nasty people just like you. And let's fill them with the same spirit Jesus had and see what happens. And you've got the book, book, the book of Acts. And suddenly, Pentecost takes place. And what was going on in Jesus is now going on in 120 in an upper room. And they're suddenly filled with the Spirit. And everything that was going on in Jesus now begins to go on in there. And 3,000 people get saved. Stop those guys. Too late. 3,120 are filled with the Spirit. And it begins to... And the next day, 5,000 get saved. And now you've got 8,120. Good night. This thing is... Now, this is an awful concept. And the reason it's such a bad concept is because it blows all my excuses. See, up to this time I've said, I'm only human. My dad dropped me twice on my head when I was a kid. That's why I am the way I am. But see, what if this wasn't about me? What if this wasn't about you? What if this was about the resource of the person of God actually coming to live within you? Then it wouldn't be about talent. Isn't it interesting in the book of Acts? You don't hear anything about talent. You don't hear anything about personality types. They were all type A. Isn't it interesting? There's none of that going on. There was nothing about education. In fact, education is downplayed. Isn't it interesting? All through the book of Acts, the whole deal is about one single thing, that the very Spirit of Jesus has come to indwell the human life. Wouldn't it be interesting if that's the total, absolute, down-to-it solution to every need of my life? Now, when you come to the book of Acts, chapter 1, the first three verses I want to read. And the interesting thing about, one interesting thing about the first three verses is, they are all, they, they're one sentence. Three verses, one sentence. So it's just, he puts a semicolon, a comma, and just, he just keeps struggling. Listen to this thing. The former I count a maid, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. In one sentence. We want to focus on verse 3. For the sake of time. In verse 3 he says. To whom he. Meaning Jesus. Also presented himself alive. Back up. To whom. To whom is obviously the disciples. So he's saying to whom. The disciples. Jesus also presented himself alive. After his sufferings. By many infallible proofs. Being seen by them during 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining. To the kingdom of God. Start with this. Focus. Did you notice the whole focus is on Jesus? If you look at it again, to whom Jesus also presented himself. If you could see this in the original language, the Greek language of the Bible, you would see that he presented his translation of one word. And that is a verb. And it's like it is in the Spanish language. The end of the verb determines what the pronoun is. So he presented is one word. But Luke wasn't satisfied with that. So he put the word ego in there, which is the word he again. And it's double emphasis. It's in the verb and it's by itself. So it would be, literally be translated like this. He, he presented. So we translated it. He presented himself. So there's a strong overwhelming emphasis and focus on the person of Jesus Christ himself. Could I tell you I have a real concern about that for us? 
See, our whole gospel story took place 2,000 years ago. It's ancient. We believe in it. We have a belief system. I've been raised in the church. I have my fundamental belief. I believe that Jesus was. I believe, I believe, but I believe in Abraham Lincoln too. So I believe, I believe, I believe, but it's a belief system. It becomes a theology. It becomes a concept. It becomes a, a doctrine. It becomes a way of life. It becomes ceremonies. It becomes an organization. It becomes a church club. It becomes, it becomes... But see, for them it wasn't that. For them it was, oh, this person, this person, this person called Jesus. Do you realize that Pentecost happened 50 days after the crucifixion? So they're within 50 days of the crucifixion. So when this is all going down and they talk to these, they, they talk and they, Peter preached the sermon at Pentecost, yet he was talking about Jesus. You know what he was talking about? He was talking about a man that you guys crucified. They saw his face. They yanked his beard out by its roots. They put a crown of thorn on his brow. They beat his back. They put their fist in his face. They didn't think in terms of a doctrine. They didn't think in terms of, a, of an idea, a concept, a philosophy. You know what they thought of? They thought of that person. And in, uh, and in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, they said, Oh, we're cut to the heart. What should we do? Peter said that simple. You crucified him, now uncrucify him. You nailed him, now unnail him. You rejected him, now embrace him. Embrace what? The person, not the idea. The person, not a concept. The person, not a philosophy. The curse, the person, not an institution. The person, the person, the person. So see, the concern is, you can say, well, I believe in Jesus. Well, I'm glad you do. But I want to know, do you have intimacy with him? Are you one with him? Is he alive in your life? I'm talking the person. Do you share his mind? Do you think like he thinks? Do you eat popcorn with him? Do you watch TV with him? Do you go to bed with him? Do you have pillow talk with him? Are you able to intimate with this person? See, is he just, well, the big man upstairs... Well, that's what I've always been trained in. See, the person. And when they begin to talk about the resurrection, what this whole passage is about, they were taught, they were absolute, they had spent, they spent 40 solid days with him, folks. 40 solid days they were with him. Can you imagine that? 40 solid days with the resurrected Lord, and they came out of there absolutely burning in their bones. Absolutely. Whoa! He is alive. Who's alive? He, the person. And it wasn't well, a philosophy of eternal life. It was a person. So here's, here's what I'd like to have happen in the next, next few days. Would you just wrap your arm around me? Could I wrap my arm around you? And could we just could we just go? Can we just go deep into intimacy with the person? Could we just go up a level in relationship with the person? Could we just see his face clearer? Could you? Could we just bounce up and down, sit on the edge of our seat, and say, "Whoa, reveal yourself to me, Jesus, the person." Could we go out of here in the next few days and say, "Whoa, I'm hyper about Jesus, the person." <laughs> What about baptism? We're not talking about that. What about communion? Not even talking about that. Well, what about the color of the carpet? Not talking about that. Could we just, whoa! The person. See, that's this passage. There's a strong focus on the person. Now, number two, form. It's interesting that they were very, very concerned not only about the person, but the fact that this person was the same identical person that they had known before the crucifixion. See, that's the passage. Did you see it? He presented himself. He's not a vapor image. Oh, 
disappears when the sun comes out. <laughs> it's like, well, we ate too much pizza and saw some things. Oh, it was again. See, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. See, they were very, very concerned that we understood that the Jesus they experienced 40 days in resurrection with, resurrection presence, after his death, 40 days they spent it with him, that that Jesus that they interacted with was the same identical Jesus, had the same attitude, wanted the same thing, had the same thought process, had the same feelings, had the same desires after his resurrection as he did before Amen. his crucifixion. Do you know what a miracle that is? Wow. Hey, you do to me what they did to Jesus, and after I come back from the dead, I'd ask some choice words for you. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Yes, sir, brother. I'd answer, well, yeah, I, hey. And on top of that, hey, I wouldn't have hung around. I'd have said, I've done my bit. I'm out of here. And the ascension would have taken place immediately. I wouldn't have hung around 40 days for you birds. I'll tell you that. What? Whoa. He hung around 40 days before. What's he doing for 12 guys? 11 guys. He hung around. Why'd he do? What's going on? Hey, see, it's the same Jesus. It's the Jesus that wore sturdy feet. So here he is doing it again. He hasn't come in condemnation. He hasn't come to put them down. He hasn't come to wipe his hands of them. He hasn't come to give them some strong rebuke. He hasn't come for that. What's he come for? You know, the same thing, thing he was here before, he's here now. Wouldn't it be interesting if the second time he comes, he'll be the same. So they're very, very interested that, oh, I want you to know this Jesus hasn't changed his mind. And the Jesus that died on a cross is the same Jesus that's coming back, folks. And his thought process of never live for yourself, of bleed, suffer, and die, of pour your life out, of give yourself up, of die to yourself, that same holiness concept that fills his life before he was crucified, existed after he was crucified, and exists now. And I know the old rugged cross is a beautiful song, but folks, I'm not exchanging it for a crown. I'm mean, going to embrace that thing in the eternity, the heart of the kingdom to come, the heart of eternity, the heart of heaven is going to be what? Oh, he's the lamb. Read it in the book of the Revelation. The lamb is at the heart of the whole heavenly scene, which is all about, hey, he's the same. <sighs> he is not, a, he wasn't against you then, he's not against you now. He fought for you then. He's going to fight for you now. The same. He's the same. And it's not about we've adjusted the theology. It's not about well the cultural now. The culture now looks at and says it should. No, this is about the person. The person. The person of Jesus. The strong focus is on the person and he's not changed. The form of his personhood is the same. Number three, the force. Isn't it interesting that it says, He presented Himself. In other words, man, I love this. In other words, the disciples didn't go after Him. They didn't hunt Him down. Who came after who here? Jesus, the person, came after them. Hey, they're hiding in an upper room. They're scared to death. They scattered like rats. They don't, well, they're on an Emmaus road saying, oh, it's all over. And Jesus comes and bangs on their forehead. They're a little hard hearing. Bangs on their forehead and says, hey! And pursued them, searched them out, and presented himself to them. He came to them. They didn't come to him. Do you know how biblical that is? In holiness, we call that provenient grace. Yeah. Which says, you don't seek him, he seeks you. See, you don't come to church and say, I've sought Jesus and found him, isn't he lucky? 
got to say, Woo! Jesus sought me and found me. Thank you, Jesus. I ran from him, man. I didn't want him. I ran from him. I hid. I tried to get away. I came to church and tried to sleep. Whoa! I tried to get out of this, but what? He wouldn't. He just. He. And I don't. He threw books at me. He did something. I don't know. He just pounded me. One man called him the hound of heaven. Said, I can feel his pending breath on my neck. I can hear his pounding feet. Pastor, the living daylights out of me. Won't leave me alone. Christian moved next door to me. Just, I just hated it. That Christian over there, he's just always witnessing to me. Turn his Christian music up real wild. Just, and I'd blow my leaves over in his yard. He'd break them up and say, thank you, I need it, Pastor Mark. <laughs> Just irritated me to death. I said, I'm getting out of here. I'm going down to my job. Good night. They hired one down there, too. They're everywhere. He's out to get me. You can run, but you can't hide. Right. That's such a power. And that's the Bible, folks. See, I'm not some kind of a salesman trying to sell you something you don't need. I'm trying to tell you, wow. What you feel going on in your life, he's stripping you down. He's, he's pushing you against the wall. He's literally stuck his fingers in the middle of the circumstances of your living and manipulated the things going on around you just to bring you to himself. You know how much he loves you? Get you to come to church when you don't even want to. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! See, that's that, folks. That's... That's not the result of a doctrine. That's not an idea. That's not a, well, a church program. See, that's not that. You know what that is? That's a loving person called Jesus who just can't let you go. Who says, I want intimacy with you. I want... Now, when he gets done with that, he gives us three participles. <laughs> Participles. What's a participle? Well, it's the verb that acts like an adjective or an adverb. Now, the verb is what? Presented. Then he says, let me describe the presentation. And he gives three participles, which modify and give content to the presentation. What are they? Alive. Look at the verse, verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive. That's the first one. He is alive. The second one, being seen. He's available. Alive, available. What's the third one? Speaking, addressing. Alive, available, addressing. Well, preacher, that's not fair. This sermon has six points. I didn't write it. Number one. He is alive. Now note what he does in the passage. He presented himself alive after his sufferings. The word suffering there is literally the word passion. It's where we get our word passion. We call the week before Jesus' death, including his death, the passion week. It's the suffering week. So what Luke is literally saying, after his Passion, suffering, he's alive! So he sets up a contrast. Over here is his suffering, over here is his death, over here is all that went on in during that week, here, over here is all the pain and agony, here's all that death stuff, that suffering, the passion week, over here is he is alive, totally, absolutely alive. Come on, you can contrast that out. Over here you got the scourging. It was a handle about that long. Nine leather throngs coming out. Something sharp at the end of each, each, each leather throng. And when it came down on the back, they literally learned to flip their wrist and it just raped your place. It didn't just hit you. It, so every time the, 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 it came down, it did nine times. They learned that if you did that 40 times on a guy, on a guy you killed him. So they backed off one. History says from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet, a man would just be literally raw. In fact, his, 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 his flesh would just hang in ribbons where they just sliced him and his inner organs would hang out. <coughs> Over here, he's alive! Got one star on his back! Totally, absolutely, Jesus. I'm 
talking the person, not a concept, not an idea, not Easter. Oh, yes. No, we're talking about the person of Jesus is Jesus is alive. Do you know when they preached about the resurrection, they didn't talk about an advanced Easter event. They didn't talk about an event. They talked about Jesus is alive. You know why they didn't talk about event? Because it's the only event in Christianity that we didn't participate in. Nobody was there. The birth of Jesus, Mary participated. Joseph certainly was around. Hey, shepherds got involved. Wise guys came from the east. So there was all of that going on. We participated. His death, we sure participated in that. His baptism, we participated in. His death, we participated in. The resurrection, hey. Well, the angel came down and rolled the stone away. Not to let him out. To let us in. And when we got in there, he was already gone. Because we didn't have anything to do with this. Because the emphasis is not on, ooh, wouldn't you like to have been there? Oh, his little toe began to wiggle, his whole foot began to shake. Whoa. I could talk about that for hours. <laughs> but see, we didn't get in on any of that. He's just gone. We don't know how it happened. It's none of our business. The whole emphasis, this person is alive. The person of Jesus Christ is alive. And over here is all of his death, all of his suffering, all the crucifixion, all of the, his lungs quit breathing, his heart quit beating. He is totally, absolutely dead. Over here he's totally, absolutely, Jesus is alive. The person of Jesus is alive. And do you realize that Paul said, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is stupid. He actually said empty. And your faith is also empty. So the whole thing's down the tubes, brother, if this Jesus isn't alive. But is he alive in you? Well, I, I, I believe in him. Well, I believe in Abraham Lincoln too, but oh. Come on. See, is he functioning in your life? Is he activating, activated in your system? Do, 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 you, do you live in him? Is he, does he live in you? Are, you? are you in love with the person? Do you realize that this hurts my masculinity terribly? But see, he's my bridegroom and I'm the bride. Do you realize what that kind of language is? That's intimate stuff, intimate stuff. That's, that's, we cuddle at night. He, he gives me pillow talk. It's, see, that's intimacy. That's, <clears throat> see, do you have it? Well, I'm going to church. Well, that's, that's fine, but it doesn't count. Well, I read the Bible. That's good, but it doesn't count. Well, I pray. That's good, but it doesn't count. Well, I gave the evangelist $50. That counts. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't count either. Come on. You know what counts? It's the intimacy, man. The person. The person. Are you getting this? The person. He is alive. Now, the second participle is available. Being seen by them. Do you see it? Verse 3. Being seen by them during 40 days. Being seen. Now, the participle form there, it's the only time that form of, of the participle is used in the whole Bible. Because the emphasis is not on Jesus is showing up, showing himself. That's not the emphasis. The emphasis is on the disciples actually seeing it. In other words, they're getting it. They're actually beginning to It's like coming to church and listening. <laughs> and isn't it interesting, in the passage, he links with that infallible proof. That's really interesting. This is phenomenal. The word infallible in the Greek language is the only time it's used in the whole New Testament. Can you imagine? The Holy Spirit, who inspired all of this, said to John, you can't use that word, boy. Don't you dare use it. Hey, Paul, you leave that thing alone, man. You're not going to use it in any of the epistles. And, oh, hey, Mark, you can't have that. Matthew, don't you touch it, son. And he saved that word. 
for right here. It's a scientific term. Luke's a doctor. He's interested in science. He's not interested in, yeah, I took a little pill. And, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I looked in the sky and I saw a cloud and I looked at the face of Jesus. And maybe it's him. See, what? He's not interested in that. He's interested in putting this thing in a test tube, boil this thing out, come back to absolute proof, brother. And when he gets done, he says, after 40 solid days, and you can fool some of us some of the time, but you can't fool all of us all of the time. 40 solid days we lived with him. We ate with him. We got up in the morning and had fish. He had fish cooking on the fire. He, fit, he fixed breakfast for us. We all sat down and he ate fish. We ate fish. He took the big fish bone and picked his teeth just like he always did. Whoa! Which proves there's going to be bathrooms in heaven. And Jesus ate, man. He ate with us. We traveled with him. We traveled with him. He taught us. We whacked him on the back and our hand didn't go through. We got up in the middle of the night and pinched him. And he, whoa, he's still there, man. He's, it, it really is him. We investigated his big right toe. On it just like he did. It's him. I'm telling you, it's him. And after 40 solid days of that, do you think you can talk us out of this? And if you want to say, well, man, like, why are you yelling about that? Because that same identical thing happened to me. I'm not talking physical. I'm talking. He came to my life, man. Yeah. He involved himself in my living. Absolutely turned my life upside down. He began to do stuff in me. Whoa. And after 40 solid days, you can't talk me out of this, buddy. Yeah. Well, what about this doctor? Don't give a rip. What about that theology? Hey, go someplace else to argue that. What I want to do is, oh, here he is. Here he is. The person, the person. And he's the same as he was when he, before his crucifixion. He's that same way now. And he's literally come to me. Do you know we have more historical, get this, historical, historical facts and evidence of Jesus' resurrection from the dead than we do George Washington being the first president of the United States? Now look at the last one. Aren't you glad for that? Address. So there's a live, available, and addressing. Speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. What they do for 40 solid days? It was a 40 day seminar. No books. PowerPoint. Woo! All on the subject of the kingdom of God. He reached back into the parables, Matthew chapter 13, all the parables of the kingdom, and he literally, we were seeing them through the eyes of the resurrection now. Whoa, what does this mean? And the whole thing changed. Kingdom of God. <clears throat> this is going to be hard. Come on, work with me. Kingdom is not what you think it is. The biblical kingdom that he's talking about is not... See, we have a cultural view of kingdom. So you've got to unlearn that cultural view in order to understand what he was saying. So you've got to unlearn in order to learn, and that's tough. To unlearn is tough. So, if I were to come to you and say, I'm a king! You would immediately turn to me and say, oh, how big's your kingdom? How many acres? What's the territory? What's your population? How much taxes do you collect? How big's your palace? See, it's about how big, how much. It's a place. That's not this. So you've got to dump that. The kingdom is within you. It's relational. It's not about place. There's a place called heaven. I love you. Go there. But hey, that's not what he's talking about here. The kingdom is a, he is describing not a place, a location to go to. He's describing a relationship, an intimacy that takes place between the king and you. And the intimacy of that 
So you've got to think in terms of relationship with the person. If I come to you and say, I have a king! Oh, you'd say, whoa, whoa, where's your king live? Outside of town. Yeah, really? Yeah. Haven't you been by there? Great big gates, man. I'm telling you, all that territory. Hey, there's all those soldiers out there, man, guarding that. And there's that great big palace. Seventeen bathrooms. <laughs> and you say, well, what's your king do all day? Well, he sits in there, and he writes out stuff and puts it in a newspaper, and I'm supposed to do it. <gasps> do you do what your king tells you to do? Kind of. But what he doesn't know won't hurt him. That's not this. See, everybody wants a God. Well, sure. Why wouldn't you want a God? I want a God. You've got to have a God. Everybody has to have a God. Why? Because there's too much to take care of. And there's a lot of stuff I don't want to mess with. Gravity. I don't want to mess with gravity. Let God take care of it. I don't want to mess with Mars and Jupiter. Hey, I've got my world. I've got my existence. Hey, I've got, he can handle that. Hey, I don't, hey, God, stay up. That's why we build a temple and put a little cubicle and put him in there. So, hey, don't call on us. We'll call on you. We know where you are. That's the concept of he lives in this building. So, hey, we'll come down here and see you. But in the meantime, on Monday, stay out of my business. See, I don't mind having a president. Why? Because, hey, somebody's got to take care of all that big stuff up there, and i got to have something to criticize. So, hey, you take care of that big stuff out there. In the meantime, i got my world, my finances, my... But what if... you got to dump that. What if the kingdom thing is relational, not a place to go to, and it's not a king that lives outside of town? What if the king comes to live in here? What? That would be worse than your mother going to high school with you. <laughs> You'd never have a day off. You'd be messing with everything, every joke you'd tell, every movement of your hand, everything you did from the snoring at night to the eating of green beans. Oh, brother. You'd never have a minute. You know, being good is okay. And a fellow ought to be good and behave himself. But you know, being good is such a drag. Every now and then you need to just take a weekend off and go get drunk. <laughs> you see how binding this is? That Jesus would actually come and live in here and get so intertwined with my being, merge with me, would become one with me until I begin to think like he thinks. I begin to feel like he feels. He and I would be in constant communi communication. We'd begin to live together. He'd be involved in every decision I make. It wouldn't be he's over there telling me what to do and I'm over here trying to do it. It would be he would be in here not only telling me what to do, but doing it. He would be sourcing me, living within me, energizing me, alive within me, intertwining within me, merging with me. How do you describe? One of the old illustrations we've used is the old glove thing. Yeah, there's the glove. It's dirty. Oh, brother. Don't bring it in the house. Oh, man. Why doesn't that stupid thing just lay there? I mean, it does nothing. A glove, empty glove, no, no energy glove. Hey, it's worthless. No, it's not worthless, but it's just, wow, it's just, what if I was a glove and Jesus came and, whoa! How strong is the glove? Strong is the hand that's within it. Well, the glove doesn't do anything. The glove does everything. No, it doesn't do anything, but it's involved in everything. And the hand doesn't do anything without the glove. <laughs> Can you imagine having Jesus in your life like that? Here's an alcoholic. Do you go up to an alcoholic, whack him on the back? I'm, man, I'm just, I admire you, sir. You're just, oh, I don't know how you do it. You make yourself drink. You just make yourself drink. I just, I, you get off your job, you run right down to the bar. Oh, 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 oh. You souse yourself every weekend. I just talk, how do you do that? Everything in your life revolves around drink. How do you, 
How do you discipline yourself? And he'd look at you and say, What are you talking about? I can't help myself! His friendships revolve around, gotta have a drink. His, his family revolves around, gotta have a drink. His job is all about, I gotta have a drink. His whole life is about, I gotta have a drink. I gotta have a fix. He's out of control. Wouldn't it be something that Jesus in your life like that? <laughs> you come down to this guy at the church and say, I admire you. You're so disciplined. You make yourself pray. You never miss church. You just read your Bible. You're just, how do you do that? He'd look at you. What are you talking about? I can't help myself. <laughs> I'm intoxicated with Jesus. I get them all. I'm out of control. I thought I'd mellow out. The older I get, the worse I get. I yell louder than I am. What's wrong with you? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's not doctrine. And it's not religion. I'm sick of that. It's not church organization. Well, well what is it? It's this, it's this person. This person. This person. I've been using merger language. You know, you can merge in what he wants. The fullness of the Spirit is about merging. I am this, he is this, and when those two merge together, you know what happens? <gasps> A new creature! It's such radical language, we call it born again! <laughs> I can't be this on my own. He isn't on this, he isn't this on his own. But when the two of us get together, whoa, this brand new thing is created. Here's what I'm after. Would you just wrap your arm around me? Could I just wrap my arm around you? Could we just, could we just sit on the edge of our seats, stand on the tip of our toes and say, oh, Jesus, just pull me into your heart. Just, just draw me into your presence. Just, just give me your mind. I want to think. Give me your heart. I want to feel. Give me, give me your desires. I want to. Would, would you just go further in this? Would you just move from? Oh, that's my belief. Would you just move from? Oh, I'll argue theology with you. I'll tell you that. Bless God. <laughs> would, would you move from that into? Oh man, I love Jesus. He's so. Oh man, we have to go back at night. We just. Would you move? Would you let him be that? <clears throat> In your life? Jesus. I didn't come after you, Jesus. You came after me. And the wonder of wonders today is that you're still coming after me. And this is not about, well, how can I get that done in my life? This is not about, well, how can I find that? This is not about, well, what do I need to do in order to get Jesus in my life like that? That's not what this is about, is it? You're, you're beating down my door. You're, you're coming with all the love songs of all the love passion of, of, of a bridegroom to just come and get me. You're, oh, you're, 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 just, you're just after me this morning. You're just, you just want me this morning. You're just wrapping your arms around me this morning. You want to fill me like a hand in a glove. You want to just literally intoxicate me like alcohol. You just want to literally overwhelm me and just be such an intimate part of my life that you are my life. Would you take all of us this morning, God, into a whole new level of intimacy and oneness and all the way from the non-Christian here this morning who doesn't know you at all to the greatest saint that's present. Could, could we all move up a step, God? Could we all just get tighter with you? Could, you all, could we all just...
It's about. You're not going to sit there this morning, are you? And tell me you know him as well as you want to. And you have as much of his presence. You feel his presence as much as you want to. And you think his thoughts as much as you want to. And you have a hunger inside. Is there some room for improvement in you on this? Have you slipped into tradition? Have you just, have you slipped into theology and belief system and you can argue, have you slipped into legalism and rules and ceremonies? Oh, no condemnation, no pressure, but wow, could we seek him? Could we seek him? Could, could we seek him? Oh, him, the person, could we seek him? Well, what if I look in the wrong direction? He'll find you. See, it isn't you seek him and find him. It's you seek him and he'll find you. You can't miss on this because he's after you. Hey, I want to kneel, man. I want to kneel. Oh, Jesus, I want you. I want you to do something in my life, Lord. Our elders will to be obedient.
by us for that today. We sang that song, there's just something about his name. Aren't you glad he's here? tonight and put on your schedule to be here and bring a friend with you. The Lord has come. He wants to talk to people's lives. I hope you've been moved today. I don't know if you have, I'm not sure have. I want to be that close to Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We praise you for what you've done. We thank you for the message and the song. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence. Lord, we pray that, that we all come back and that we just spend, take this time out of our calendar. Oh, Lord, I know we've got tons of things to do, but can we set aside four days and give it unto you that you might move in a powerful way and make us the people that we ought to be in that close to you. Lord, we want to be part of that kingdom. We just praise your name. Now may the blessings of a tribe of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you all. So we meet again tonight or in the next couple days. And the Lord, just be with us in an awesome way. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.